Hi, I've been asked to answer a few questions from Professor Garlich Schmoyley about forecasting with big data. So the first one is, what is the meaning of big data in time series forecasting, and can you give a few examples from projects you've worked on? So time series, as you probably know, are data that are collected sequentially over time. So it's very unlikely that one single time series will be particularly long. If you think big data means data that can't fit onto a single ordinary sized computer, then no time series is that long. So if you want to think about big data in the context of forecasting and time series, you need to think about lots of time series. Um, so for example, you might be looking at sales of a company and you have uh, daily sales data going back a few years and you might be having lots of different products for that company and you're looking at sales for each product in each store in every country of the world. And so in that's, that way you end up with a large collection of data because there's lots and lots of time series. Or you, uh, another situation of, of dealt with big data in a time series context was when we were looking at a security streaming data. So it's a company that was monitoring the security around a building and they had a fence with, which, on which was mounted several hundred sensors that were detecting movement in the vicinity of the building. Each of those sensors was sending a signal, uh, or several signals every second. And it, it just was continually streaming all the time. So you know, in, in only a, an hour or so, you end up with gigabytes of data. And, and over a long period of time, you have a seriously large data set. So big data in time series generally means lots and lots of time series, each one of which may not be particularly long. Uh, second question was, how does the forecasting process differ for few versus many series? When you have a few series, you can afford to spend some time looking at the results and maybe tweaking the method that you're using uh, for each individual series. You might account for some peculiarities and features of each series and end up with a forecasting model that's tuned to the individual series that you've got. But once you get above a handful of time series, it's just no longer possible to spend the time looking at each individual time series separately. So you need some kind of automatic algorithm which will generate forecasts for you. So with lots of series when you do forecasting, automation is crucial because you just cannot do it uh, in any manual sense. Third question is what software can be used for forecasting mini series and can they be used as part of an automated solution? So yes, there's quite a lot of software out there now that does automatic forecasting. Um, are the statistical software platform is one where there's a, a package called forecast which is which is my own package and I've written several algorithms in the package that will do automatic forecasting so the best known of those um, algorithms are the ETS algorithm which does automatic exponential smoothing and then there's an auto dot arima algorithm which does automatic arima modeling but the forecast package for R is not the only software around that can do automatic forecasting uh, one that's been around for several decades, which is excellent, is Forecast Pro, which is available for Windows. Um, and that's used by lots of companies for doing their automatic forecasting. And it has quite good integration with other software systems. More recently, Tableau has uh, produced some automatic forecasting within their software. I actually wrote the algorithm for Tableau. Um, there's a company called Thrive Technologies that I've worked with, which has a very good forecasting algorithm to automatically forecast um, very, very quickly. It's the fastest automatic forecasting algorithm I've ever seen. What are the benefits and dangers of automation? That's question number four from Galit. Well, the obvious benefits are that it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of money. You can just give your time series to a computer and it will give you back some forecasts. The danger, of course, is that no automatic algorithm will work well for every series. I spend a lot of time looking for edge cases where my algorithms don't work and trying to find ways to improve the algorithms to cope with more types of data. But it's a never ending quest. And sometimes I modify an algorithm so that it does better for some time series only to find that it's actually made things worse on other series. So there's always going to be particular time series where your automatic algorithm, whichever one you use, where the automatic algorithm does not do so well. A good strategy that I encourage my clients to do is to try to identify the series that are not being forecast well and just look at those ones. 
and let the automatic algorithm do the bulk of the series. And then you can concentrate on spending your analyst time, which is expensive, spending that time on the, the cases where the automation is not working so well. And Garlick's last question concerned forecasting competitions. She says, in several forecasting contexts in which you were involved, participants were tasked with forecasting hundreds or thousands of series. What effective approaches and conclusions emerged from these contests? Well, there's a few things that have come out of those sort of competitions. The first is keep it simple, or at least keep it sophisticatedly simple. Large complicated models do not always work well on time series data because the individual time series are not necessarily very long. And if you have a, have a large complicated model, you tend to overfit. So uh, for example, uh, time series competitions generally Find, you generally find that neural networks don't do very well because they're designed for very large collections of data and the individual time series are often not long enough to fit a, a good neural net. On the other hand, some quite simple methods like exponential smoothing tends to do pretty well in forecasting competitions, especially when those competitions involve data that show trend and seasonality. I guess the other thing I would say is that in competitions and elsewhere is to use methods that have been well tested on similar types of data. For example, you can split your, each of the time series into a training set and a test set, apply your methods to forecast the test set and see what works well. And then you know what could be, what, what you could use going forward. It's amazing how many people don't do that. Just testing a range of different approaches out on, on test sets, on holdout sets to check what, what's, works well and what doesn't work well. Okay, so there's the, uh, the five questions from Galit. Um, it was uh, fun to be able to answer them and uh, I hope that's been helpful. Thank you.